Hello Noble Ones, welcome back to my channel. This is the Metatron speaking. Today, finally the time has come for a full evaluation of my Samurai armor. Okay then, so as you know I've, I've had this uh, Samurai armor for I think a couple of weeks now, maybe three weeks perhaps, something like that, and I have deliberately decided to postpone the uh, full evaluation of the Samurai armor and a full explanation of the of, a, of Samurai armor's functionality because I wanted to actually try it and see how it functions and see how it feels. So now I can say that I have sparred with it, I fought with it, I ran, I horsebacked, I tried loads of different things and now I have a full understanding which is not only theoretical like it was uh, up to now but I, now I, have, I actually know what I'm talking about because I, I could actually experience it. So just to sum it up, to say what we're going to do in this video, I'm going to talk about pros and cons of Samurai Armor. I'm going to talk about the weak points and weak spots that I have noticed the uh, Samurai Armor has, but also some positive things and positive aspects that I have to say really surprised me. Now, I would like to begin with the helmet and of course we will start with the crest. Uh, in Japanese that's called a maedate, so maedate, maedate. And th there's a whole variety of different forms and shapes, of course depending on the clan for example or even personal preference of the samurai. Um, in this case I have basically this one which represents the, the moon. Um, sometimes you also have the uh, crescent uh, moon, which is another one that I would like to get. Normally that one is normally linked to the date clan, but it, it depends. I would like to get that one, that one too. Now something that's interesting about the Mai Date is the fact that it's removable. So you can easily remove it, remove it, as you can say, as you can see, and, uh, and then put it back again. So you can change it. You can buy a Kabuto and then you change your mind and you want to change it and you put something else, it's easier to do. Um, now, how much weight does this increase on the Kabuto? Almost nothing. It's virtually um, the same, so there is no weight whatsoever. Perhaps with some other kinds, there might be a little bit of weight, but not that much. As I said, I've tried sparring, I've tried doing forms and, and kata and lots of different things um, with the helmet on and everything. Only once it happened to me, I have to say, that uh, I was wielding the katana from a jodan position, so this one here, okay, and as I went down, I performed the move wrongly and I kind of hit myself, so the katana went like this, all right? It only happened to me once, considering that I've been using it like every day for two weeks, I think it's quite good, uh, a good percentage, and also you need to consider that I don't think as someone I would have made that mistake. Although perhaps in the bulk of battle, but then again, it didn't stop my attack, I actually went through it and it just made a little sound and, I, and my attack was, it wasn't even slowed down. So again, I don't think this is that much of big of a deal it's a decoration, but it's also important to complete the samurai and to recognize your, your friends from your foes, which is also one of the reasons why they used sometimes specific colors and other times they also use you know, all the symbols, as you can see, and the banners. Let's continue. Now, the kabuto, which is the helmet in Japanese, kabuto. Now, for the Italians there, uh, because I'm Italian, as you know, um, please notice that the accent is on the first vowel, kabuto. Kabuto, as we Italians tend to uh, put the accent in the following vowel, so we tend to say Kabuto, but it's Kabuto, okay? Now, this, in my case, this is just made of three pieces, and then we have this part here, which are lots of different segments, I will talk about that in, in a minute. But you can also have a, kind of a much higher quality Kabuto, which will be completely laminated, which means you have lots of different um, segments which create the helmet. Um, I didn't. I, I actually like this one, so I didn't really care. Uh, also, because a fully laminated kabuto can cost a lot more, so I was happy with this one. But again, it's very comfortable. Um, you have perfect vision when you don't wear your mempo, your mask. Um, but even with that on, vision is quite good. Now we have these th two extra protections to deflect attacks. This is the, the whole principle. Also the shape, it's shaped in a way that if an at a direct attack, to attack arrives, it tends to, to glide, okay, to slide to the, to the edges. This is the whole concept with the full um, uh, design of the samurai armor. As far as the weight is concerned, again, 
I wore it for half a day, almost eight hours in a row, took it off, no problems, fresh as a spring morning. Moving to the shikoro. So these ones here, called in Japanese shikoro, are the protection for the sides and the back of the helmet. Now these are very important because the way they are organized, they give you complete freedom of movement of the head because as you go back with the head, they actually slide up and go inside one another, similarly to the Roman lorica segmentata, for example, or some folds of medieval European plate armor. Now moving to the mask, this is called menpo, menpo, or mengu, mengu. So you have two possibilities, menpo, mengu. Clearly this one is here to add facial protection and also to make him appear more fearsome. So there is also a whole psychological um, aspect to the mask, the mempore. It does not impede your vision at all. So my peripheral vision is complete because of the way this is cut and shaped. It's a kind of a triangular shape. So again, this is a choice. You could get hit in the eyes. They chose vision over protection in this case. It's always a choice. You have to choose one or the other. Sode or pauldron, that the ones you see here are 16th century pauldrons and therefore are smaller than the ancient shield-like ones. But I will discuss this very point in a dedicated video. I'm moving to the yodarekake or the bever. Now this is probably the only part of Japanese armor I don't particularly like because I think it's quite good against direct attacks, but a blade could go under it. However, I do have to say that there are auxiliary armor parts supposed to provide extra protection for the neck. Simply in my kind of armor, those are not present. Now, moving to the breastplate and the cuirass itself. Now, in Japanese, this is called do. Now, please notice that it's not pronounced do, but it's pronounced do. So, double o. Okay, you just make it longer. This is probably the part that really surprised me the most. The fact is that, of course, it has its weight, uh, because this, as I said, this is iron, so it's metal uh, bands, uh, lacquered, but it's still metal, it has its weight. Um, however, I was incredibly surprised because when I wore this, I put it on both the back plate and the breast plate together, um, I, it really feels incredibly light. I was expecting it to be, to, to be a burden for my shoulders. Uh, instead, it wasn't the case. And I have to thank Knight Errant, my fellow YouTuber Knight Errant, because he made me realize that, or at least he made me notice, the reason why uh, it worked like that. Now, Knight Herent has made a video, and I wish to uh, leave uh, a link to this video, uh, where he talks about breastplate in European plate armor, but I have to say that I noticed something similar between the two kinds of armor. The fact is that, as you can see, the breastplate is quite short. It finishes at the natural waist. Um, it doesn't go all the way down to the belt, okay? And, and this is something that you have in European plate armor, like Knight Errant has um, professionally explain in this video, but it also happens in Japanese armor. Now the reason why this is really good, it's a really really good thing, is because first of all this is where you have, um, this is kind of the, the area of your body that manages to carry uh, weight uh, more easily and this is one of the reasons when we wear a tracking um, backpack for example or a rucksack, you actually um, fasten it around here, don't you? Um, also it doesn't impede as much your mobility because you are free to move three-dimensionally with your all torso and chest area. Well, as you can see, as far as the Japanese are concerned, uh, they just leave it completely open. I can actually put my hands in here. So this is definitely a weak point of samurai armor. Now, as we move further back down, we reach the fold, the protection for the lower torso, we could say, including your groin area and your upper thighs. Now, in Japanese, this is called ksazuri, ksazuri. Now, one thing I really like about Japanese ksazuri is the fact that it's it being laminated this way, it having all these uh, bands, um, it slides up very easily. So this is a good thing when you need to, for example, horse ride or simply sit down. We move to the haidate, which are the thigh guards, normally tied around the waist, exactly right above your navel. They protect the thighs, 
very comfortable to wear. They were normally made from cloth with small iron plates of various size and shape sewn onto the cloth. They're normally fastened and secured behind the thigh. This particular feature, um, I notice that it gives a lot of freedom to move both to your, to your legs and to your torso. Now, moving to the protection for the arms, we have the cote, which is this one here, and, and then the tecco, tecco, which is the protection for the hands. So, cote, tecco. Now, the protection for the arms is really peculiar. Um, it's interesting because it's designed as to give the, as much freedom as possible to the combatant, in this case, the samurai. Uh, but not only to be able to swing his yari and katana properly, or notachi or tachi, depending on the situation, but also to use the, his bow. So it was designed, keeping in mind that the samurai was also an archer, just as much as a, as a foot soldier or, an, or, a, or a cavalry or a mounted uh, unit. So again, comparing it with a full plate armor, for example, we don't have as much protection, particularly if you look at the back, because as you can see, there is only textile uh, protection. It's only clothing, really. It's silk. So it's not going to prevent, uh, to protect you that much. It will, some, uh, quite a bit, because you know that clothing does protect you, but not as much as a gambeson would have. Okay. Um, but the top of the arm is protected by mail. It's butted mail most of the times, so, though, because you need to consider riveted mail, although it did exist after the Japanese started to um, having to do with us Europeans. Uh, but traditionally speaking, and most of the times, it was butted mail. However, this butted mail, it's actually quite resistive. So I'm not saying it's as resistive as riveted European mail, but it is definitely a lot better and does a much better job um, than any, for example, butted steel uh, mail armor um, that you could find, for example, for, for LARP or, or even reenacting when, when you don't have actually fully closed rings. Also, you will appreciate that the rings are particularly small, in this case, the inner diameter, of course. So you have a mesh of rings and interlocking plates. Now even in this case we don't have one solid plate or two, three solid plates, but we have quite a lot of small um, plates. Again, this was to, to try to reduce as much as possible the weight on the arms of the combatant. So again, uh, this, this is one of the, the greatest differences um, of samurai armor compared to all other kinds of armor really, is that the arms are very light. Now the tech core is interesting because it only provides you with protection if you have your fists closed. Okay, if your hand is open, your fingers are at risk. But of course, it was part of the some of the samurai's training to make sure he would keep his hands closed as much as possible, also during combat. The reason for this choice was again because the samurai needed to use a bow. And so his fingers needed, the, particularly the tips, the tip of his fingers needed to be free. And that's the same, and also to have a better um, grip on his sword, to be able to feel your sword. There are versions which include gloves. Mine didn't come with it because I don't particularly like uh, this idea. It's more of a traditional one, uh, 16th century armor, as I said. And in this case, no gloves at all. So there is no protection for the back, um, sorry, for, for this part of my hand. Now moving for the, to the protection of the shin, this is again another area that really surprised me a lot. The fact is that, as you can see, it's basically a demi-greave. This is what it is. So one would expect it to be particularly uncomfortable. In fact, I have had some questions asking me how, how comfortable it was, if it was, if it was actually digging into your ankle. Well, the first thing I would like to say is that it does not dig into your ankle because it's not supposed to reach it. Okay, so it's very, very short it's supposed to reach and protect your kneecap. So it's never going to make it all the way down to your lower leg. In fact, the lower portion of your legs and your feet is probably the most exposed part in samurai armor. Now, it's true that the armor was custom made for me, but again, I was incredibly surprised by how well it fits, even with no pointing. Because if you compare it to any 15th century, for example, 14th century, 
plate grieve, particularly the closed ones, you will know that there will be a lot of differences. I mean, greaves were, were used pointing, greaves used attachment parts to, so that they could be, part of the weight would have been suspended, attaching it to the quiz or and so forth, attaching it to your gambus and um, to your arm in doublet. This is completely not done in Japanese armor, but you do use these laces, which will go all the way around your, your calf three times, I had them on for five hours and I even forgot to take them off and I had lunch with them because I forgot I was actually wearing them. This is how comfortable samurai greaves are. Now these in Japanese are called suneate. Suneate. Now moving to the footwear, in this video I will only mention the footwear and I will have a dedicated video to it. But just to, to mention these two kinds of, of shoes that a samurai could have chosen from. First one will be a waraji, more commonly used, which are basically straw rope sandals. And the second ones are geta, which are basically wooden clogs, we could say, with an elevated wooden base. Now this doesn't mean that samurai never used any kind of protection for the feet. In fact, as a matter of fact, they also used short leather shoes trimmed with bare fur and other kinds of protection. That's not what I use because that's not the kind of 16th century armor that I wanted. We'll discuss auxiliary parts of Japanese armor in a dedicated video. Thank you very much for watching and remember the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.